Yeah, was there a demand about everything for everybody? Have a good one, peeps. Yeah. Someone asked, you can't be everything for everybody. Yeah, yeah. Oh, gonna... so would you like to address? Uh, yeah, that? yeah, I would. Would, um, yeah. I, I'd like to hear. Yeah, man, I would love that. So the process of how we support people in getting their questions answered is, we've got a few questions here. Um, we've got a chat going here, but the most important thing is, yeah, we're, we're keeping a kind of interview style going okay, on, so yeah, if yeah. I see a chat that's relevant, I'll ask yeah, yeah. But we'll start on what, what you thought was relevant about... That demand for... Air. It, uh, look, I, I'm not sure if this was the intention of your question, and obviously I'm speaking only personally, but the line actually everything for everybody um, is a really interesting line because they're, they're, this is certainly not the views of everyone in occupa uh, the occupation movement, but people who particularly influence me, which are the, um, the Zapatistas from Chiapas, in Mexico actually have a slogan and that slogan is we demand everything for everybody and it's more posed as a question when we talk about well what kind of society do you want to have like you, rather than limiting demands to specific things you want a society where the limit of its possibility is on the basis that the wealth the access to participation meaningful content is something that is open for all people right and therefore things that are that's an inherently egalitarian idea which means um, rather than saying okay we want X amount of money for this we want increasing for wages we want a society that ends with this kind of ism it sets a kind of fundamental norm now it's not gonna be achievable we're not gonna be able to have you know flying helicopters for everyone but it suggests a kind of basic idea for society that what you aim for is that the things that allow us to real ourselves as human beings are open to all so I, I'm not sure that probably wasn't the intention of your question, but it just kind of rung a bell. Yeah, so thank you very much for sharing no that. And I was a little bit caught up in reading some of the other comments, so yeah. I didn't hear um, all of that to be able to engage okay, in the cool. conversation with you. That's cool. But let's, um, Charlie, do you have a question? Yes, us? we do have um, a brief question. Uh, someone was asking previously, um, asking about us responding to the argument that 99% erases relevant histories such as class, race and gender. And the argument is something like histories come from specific uh, locations, economic and racial content, etc. Um, they also were a little bit upset that we didn't answer their question, or that I didn't answer the question. The reason I didn't do that is I didn't want to make my gender and sexuality a particular issue. I, I, I feel quite comfortable talking about that. Yeah. I mean, and, and, like, personally, I think I agree with that premise of the question, that there's not a kind of undifferentiated 99%, but the vast majority of people are, we kind of cleaved in really important ways along questions of class, of race and gender. So actually, to become a 99% means we need to actually engage with those separate histories. And I actually think this is what's happening around the world. That when you posit the idea that we're the majority, what you've actually got to um, then do next is go, well, what are the internal divisions? And so that's been raised already by some people in the occupation. We're saying, well, look, is the space particularly kind of male dominated? What are the gender dynamics that are going on? Do we need to bring that up in a process to question? So I actually agree with that. It's a problem that any mass movement has to deal with. That there's not just some opposition out there, but these lines of division are actually internal to the majority too. So completely agree. So I'm looking at a scale of the quality that is uh, going from as small as it could be to as large as it could be. I'll just see if there are any comments yeah, through, yeah, relating sure. to what um, uh, just uh, so, uh, talked about. I understand about. I'm speaking in really general terms at the moment. So uh, if people are dissatisfied with that, I get it. Uh, do you ha uh, have you been watching the feed or reading the questions? Because reading questions and watching. Okay, so then next question. Next question. Um, people are. What is your view on people like Bill Gates and Warren Buffett who are trying to get billionaires to donate their money either now or at their death towards philanthropy projects that will help millions or billions of people? What can the movement do to encourage that? Oh, for me. <laughs> Either of you. Um, oh, look, personally, I'm really critical of it. Yeah, so... For me... Yeah, well, no, well, yeah but for, no, look, for me, it's like... Look, okay, first of all, like, people want to de donate. That's fantastic, right? That's excellent. Uh, what I'm critical of is that there's a history from the Medici's on where donation, that what this never kind of addresses is the actual systematic inequalities that has meant that they've generated this wealth in the first part. 
Well, yeah, it, but it's, it actually what it says. Okay, there's not a deep structural inequality in society. What we just need is people at the top to be kinder. What it doesn't address is why we. What is the actual real histories, the real complicated histories that have created a globe of such inequity? Yeah, uh, you know, and so we wouldn't have to have them at the top yeah. donating if everyone was equal and well, had all the resources. That doesn't mean that I think they're bad people or I don't want them to donate. But I think in some ways it kind of mystifies the issue of what's really important. Now, again, I'm just speaking from my own um, personal opinion, is that um, my own personal opinion, there's a really great video by Slavio Zizek, who some people might have noticed because he was on Q&A recently, who says that actually kind of capitalism at this moment always pretends it's doing charity. You know, you can't go to Starbucks anymore without being told that what you're actually doing is saving an African child by buying this coffee, right? But that actually hides the actual processes of what's actually creating these forms of structural poverty. All right, so there's a comment by Kat, yep, which is, I don't understand all these people build up the wealth from virtually nothing and works hard to get there. Yeah, well, look, a lot of people, well, a lot of people work really hard to get lots of places, but, you know, Bill Gates and Warren Buffett don't have such a disproportion in wealth from ordinary people because they worked X amount of times more than the people that they have a great more wealth than. There's actually structural reasons that led to that. Now, um, also in the term of Bill Gates, well, I don't know the story particularly. There's a really great um, political economist called Doug Henwood who does a newsletter called uh, Left Business Observer, also a radio show um, called Behind the News. And he makes an argument, and I'm sorry I don't have the specific details about this, that actually a lot of those original operating systems that um, Bill Gates has made so much um, money out of, developed out of in pre pretty much university projects uh, that were going on at different kind of research institutions at universities at the time. What he's really good about, you know, what Bill Gates does really well is impose property rights on collective processes of creation. Now that's the Microsoft model, isn't it? We know like that the internet is actually at its most, most fertile when people cooperate. How does Microsoft make money? They impose rent on this creativity and they impose it by imposing property rights and this actually holds back the creative capacities that actually develop from that. So that, that, that would be my take on it. I don't doubt he works hard, but I know there's a lot of people who work really hard and there's not a clear correlation between hard work and material rewards. So, I also just re in response to Share Free, yeah, I hope the banner Occupy Brisbane.org is still here, otherwise we'll have some resources to build another one. Um, and people the want other to question... Know, um, people want to know, um, do you want the wealthy to share their wealth whether legitimately attained or not? Uh, question no, look, I, I, actually, no, look, again, I'm only, look, I'm, gonna have to, I'm only speaking, again, I want to reinforce my own um, perspective, and this is um, not the perspective of everyone here, but personally, it's not a question about sharing wealth, it's about developing a different way that wealth is actually produced. So I'm quite radical about this, I think we need to transform uh, the way that wealth uh, work is organised and distribution is organised. So it's not just here's a bundle of goodies, who gets what, but how do we democratically organise how things are produced, which is what we do when we cook dinner with our family anyway, which is how we organise a barbecue. It's extending these kind of collective democratic organising wider across the society. Um, yeah. Okay, um, another question. Sorry, uh, my computer is just mic'd up a bit. Um, can you please provide an example of how global banking has controlled the government into doing something detrimental to the 99%? Uh, no, I can't, because that's not my analysis of what's caused the economic crisis. Uh, Oh, okay. On what basis do you claim to represent the 99%? I don't claim to represent the 99%. I think the movement is a movement of people that are advancing broader causes, but as this movement has always said, it's creating a space for people to come and express themselves. This is a, a this is a kind of rhetorical device we get from the media that says, ah, how can you claim to represent? Well, when did that demand actually emerge from the Occupy movement? If anything, the Occupy movement has always emphasized that it's about creating space for multiple different opinions. So in some ways, look, I get where you're coming from, but I reject the basis of your question. <laughs> Uh, further questions? Give me one moment, sorry. Um, oh my god! This chick I went to school Ah, wow. 
What is the undemocratic okay. about the current white people currently get jobs oppor and opportunities? Well, I think it's undemocratic. Um, Look, it's a re that's a, a really good question, and it actually means what you think the definition of democracy is. Now, if you're a liberal democrat, um, then you think, well, the economy solves itself as this, that the economy is something separate from politics. Democracy is over here, and that's representation. And politics and uh, the, the market, that's just this form of free individuals. Well, I don't actually have that understanding of the economy or of democracy. For me, democracy is about the vast majority of people having meaningful decisions in how things are organised. So yes, in an advanced capitalist society like Australia, there is a relative freedom of which jobs you can apply for. But the actual processes of work themselves are both exploitative and dominating. That when we sell our wage labour, we enter into a condition where it's not stops becoming a free exchange, but rather we're dominating by those processes. So democratic attempts would be things like you know, the occupations of, of factories that happened in Argentina after the economic crisis, where when the banks, you know, uh, dropped, well, well, when the economic crisis hit and the owners tried to shut these companies down, the workers themselves took them over and self-managed them. So it's a far different idea of what democracy is. It's not about can I choose this job or that job. It's about how is the work process, what we create, at what rate we create, and then how we distribute what we produce decided. So that's not the state. I'm not arguing for some you know, overarching state authority that says you've all got to wait to wear grey uniforms. It's about how the fundamental things we spend most of our lives doing become controlled by the people who do them. That again is just my own opinion. Okay. Um, and I am very tired. Various people want to know um, what are we doing regarding protests or tour? Pardon? What? Most people want to know what we're doing regarding protests or tours or further protests against uh, yeah, I, I um I don't have any information on that. You'll have to ask someone else at the occupation. Yeah. Right. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Uh, what do the wealthy do with the wealth they have now? Um, and you know, if you want to change wealth, uh, what would you make the wealthy do with their wealth? Well, I, I wouldn't make the wealthy do much with their wealth. What I suggest is changes how we produce wealth. Right. Um, and I've got to say as well, like I don't have a critique of like particular rich people being bad. I've got a critique of the way that we organise production. This is my opinion, by the way, of course, not the opinion of the occupation. Right. What part do you think globalisation plays in the disparity between the rich and the poor? That comes from John Smith. Yeah. Okay, John. I, another great question. Again, it's a question of definition. This is what do you mean? globalization to be. Yeah, like my understanding of globalization would be at the end of the 70s you've had quite serious social struggle that's gone on all around the world, particularly in the north. And one of the responses to this um, by capital was to offshore production. You know, so you, you're thinking about you know the large factories in places, you know, the running the progressive running down of steelworks, um, you know, the car factories in cities like Detroit, things like this. Part of the process of globalization was actually to offshore these processes or for capital to leave direct production of goods itself and move into financial markets. So you, what you had from these struggles in the 60s in a very, very short way, obviously it's an incredibly complicated process, was a complete reorganising of where work is organised, uh, where work is done, uh, who gets paid what, how the production process um, fits in, cut, coupled with a massive expansion of um, unpayable debt to most of the developing nations. These have structurally built in some of these inequalities. Important to that too is this thing called the Washington Consensus. And now very short Shortly, the Washington Consensus was basically for these developing countries to receive loans, had to accept a mode of governance, what you might call neoliberalism, what you might call you know, neoclassical economic thought, which meant these states were prevented from investing in things such as welfare and education, forcibly had to privatise um, sources they were generating wealth from. So very much this complicated process we call globalisation uh, is deeply tied into the real inequalities, but it's also deeply tied into what's caused the crisis crisis because what this has led to is a collapse of what you might want to call effective demand which is how much 
money people have to actually realise the goods that they can purchase. As more and more work moved overseas and jobs stagnated, Australia is an exception, but throughout the North, I mean wages stagnated, effective demand was stimulated largely by a massive expansion of credit. Now it's that apparatus that has exploded in the last four years. So one of the real problems for the global economy is who's going to buy all this stuff that's made? Now this speaks to us in Australia, and again it's my own opinion, I'm moving really quickly. Australia is in a long, long mining boom. Why are we in a mining boom? Because we dig stuff out of the ground and we sell it to China and China sells stuff and they sell it to the US. We, we, and with the collapse of effective demand, what are the, the people in China, who are they going to sell these products to? And so this is actually leading to the economic crisis. I've got to get out of the hot seat. Other people have to have a talk. Yep. Um, lovely talking to you. Uh, hope that helped answer some questions.